So uh, thanks again for the invitation. It's fun uh, being here uh, in Stockholm again. And I'm going to tell you a little bit today uh, both about deep learning and how we implement deep learning. So hopefully it will be a quick tutorial for those of you who are not an expert in deep learning to know what we're talking about. And I'll talk a little bit about implementation and how you can actually use it. And I will try to show also some demos to make it uh, more interesting. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about me. I was a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon, where I started to work on a, a project called the Graph Lab. It's an open source project. It uh, started seven and a half years ago. And uh, about two and a half years ago, once the project became uh, more popular, we formed a company in Seattle. Uh, we have 45 people, very strong research team in machine learning. So we have 12 PhDs and two professors uh, for machine learning uh, in the team. And this is our core expertise. We implement machine learning methods uh, for uh, programmers. So I want to start by uh, giving you an, uh, some kind of cool example, cool application uh, for uh, what is deep learning. And this is uh, an application we've implemented. And later I will show you the code which uh, actually runs this kind of application. But let me first uh, fix the displays. Just a second. OK. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, so this is an application we call PhotoTag. It's a quick demo of uh, deep learning capabilities. And what we have here is a data set of 1.2 images, which is called ImageNet. And uh, I can click on any image. I have no clue what, what it is. The nice thing is that each time I load it, there are a random set of images out of the 1.2 uh, 1 mil, 1 million. And each image has a label, which is hand uh, assigned by human to say what's inside the image. So the image is sent to the server, and then we get a prediction what's inside the image. In this case, uh, we are correct. This is a mitten. Let's try something else. So this is, a, we are 100% sure this is a Mexican hairless. Um, so this kind of problem is called the multi-class classification problem. Uh, the task is actually, given an image, try to understand what's inside uh, the image. What I can further do, and this is more interesting, is also give the application images that we're not including in the trained data set. So let's say I want a panda bear. I'm now going to get the images. So it may take a few seconds. Depends on uh, get the images <laughs> serving capabilities. Let's see if it will work. Yeah, so what I'm getting here, I'm getting panda bear images that we've never seen before. And I, again, I can click on an image. The image is sent to a predictive server. And uh, we get a prediction, which is a giant pandas. And in this case, I don't have the true labels because we've never seen it. But I can tell you that this is a giant panda. So in this case, we are correct. So let me get back to the slides. And just to recap what we've seen here in the last two minutes. So basically, uh, we have an image classification problem given an input image which is a binary file with some uh, image format, we would like to uh, compute output where the output is a few classes that are, uh, we suspect this image is from a few classes, and uh, this is the prediction. Okay, the way deep learning is implemented, it's implemented in what we call deep learning um, uh, neural networks, which are the, the basis of deep learning. And neural networks have um, what we call the ability to um, construct what, uh, something which we call very nonlinear features. So what are uh, nonlinear features? I will uh, uh, remind you what are linear features or linear classifiers for uh, a second, just to um, 
set up the discussion. So when we have uh, two uh, groups of items, we have plus and minuses, and our task is to find some kind of a separator. In the linear case, it's just a line or a hyperplane which separates those two dots. And the way it works is we uh, compute uh, each of these um, dots is actually an n-dimensional vector. We would like to compute some weights. When we multiply them with the uh, observation, then we get a score. And the score could be either positive, if it's a, a plus sign, or it could be a negative, whether it's a minus sign. So this is what we call a binary classification task using a linear classifier. The same uh, um, diagram I can uh, replot in a slightly different way of a graph representation, which is uh, identical to what I showed earlier. But in this case, we take all the features x1 uh, through xd, and then we write them in some kind of graph representation where we multiply them uh, with the weights uh, in order to get the same score. So this is how we can uh, represent it. So this is a linear classifier, very simple. Most of you probably know it. And uh, it can generate a lot of, uh, it can uh, capture a lot of uh, uh, operations. So in the case of linear, uh, uh, of a Boolean algebra, we can actually uh, see that OR operation and END operation are two types of operation that it's very easy to capture using those linear relations. So we just sum up some weights and uh, then we get a result, and it's easy to verify that this is indeed uh, OR and END operations, where the inputs are binary, uh, 0 and 1. So that's a nice property of linear classifier. However, linear classifiers are kind of limited because they cannot represent everything. And this is uh, one example where uh, uh, the power of linear classifiers cannot help us, and this is the XOR uh, operation where we actually need uh, some better tools, some tools that are uh, more powerful. And the way we can do it is actually very simple. We can create a, another a network which has two stages. So basically, we define two new variables, Z1 and Z2, which are based on the end not combination of the previous variables. And then what we can do, we can actually use to uh, uh, one step of two linear transformations to get the Z1 and Z2. So this step is linear. But then we do thresholding to 0 and 1. And then again, another linear step. So this kind of construction is, uh, um, it has two layers. And it has both a linear operation, but also a thresholding operation, which is nonlinear. And now uh, we got a construction which is way more powerful than just a linear network uh, because we can support more advanced operations like the XOR operations, uh, which is not supported in a linear network. So this is a, a kind of a quick motivation for a neural network. So what we have in a neural network is basically a lot of layers. In each layer, there is a, some kind of a linear operation. But after the linear operation, we do some kind of thresholding operation or other functions which are nonlinear. And this is the power of uh, neural networks. Neural networks is a very uh, established research field. It's uh, been around for at least 50 years. But what's uh, more interesting is that it usually was a very theoretic uh, field without many applications. And only in the last years, and uh, more specifically in 2012, when the ImageNet competition started, then a uh, neural network get uh, started to win as a very uh, useful uh, computation primitive for us. And one of the main uh, reasons is that actually we have much better hardware. The algorithms are very heavy uh, in computation. And then we get the better hardware, and we can actually start implementing them in practice. So let me uh, discuss in a little more detail about how deep learning is used in computer vision. And I will start uh, with how Previously, before deep learning, what was the typical approach in uh, computer vision? So the, um, the basic functionality that we'd like to do here, we again talk about image classification. We would like to know whether this is a face or not a face. And uh, what we do here is basically we run some uh, filters or transformations in order to identify a certain properties of the image. So in this case, 
we would like to identify whether there is a nose and eyes and eyes and mouth and so on. And then we would like to use uh, some kind of classifier in order to tell us whether this is a face or not a face. So that's the traditional approach. The problem with this approach is that many of those um, feature detectors are not so easy to uh, tune and utilize. And there is a rich literature from all the 30 years of uh, image processing about what kind of features you can uh, try from different types of images. So uh, there are many such uh, features. So how, how does it uh, typically work? You take an image, you run some filters, you get some features, and then you would like to say whether this is a face or not by using a classifier based on the features. So the features are basically some kind of representation of the image. The problem with those features, you need to really be a real mathematical expert in order to understand what you're doing and how to construct different features for different images. So for example, if you have X-ray images, you may need different features than regular RGB images and so on. So how does deep learning work uh, if not using features? So what we have here, we actually learn the features from the data without specially crafting them or designing them. And the way we work, we work with few hierarchy of layers, because I told you we have a few layers. And um, the way it works, we start from the lower um, hierarchy of the image, then we have very small patches of the image. So we have patches like dots and very small lines that you can see on the bottom left, which are not really, we, don't, we can't tell what object it is, but just some shapes. And then we go to higher level layers that we have things like lines and small squares and things like that. And once we go to the top layers, we start to see things like people faces or car wheels or animal tail and things like that. So that's the higher layer, which are actually objects. And, and we make the prediction on, based on all these uh, layers. We combine information from all the layers. So why is deep learning so uh, successful and so um, um, such a hot buzzword these days? Uh, the thing is, the, those algorithms have really, really good performance. They actually have the best performance. And uh, even this year, we crossed the boundary of having a slightly better performance than a human being. So it's really better than a human expert. Uh, one example is a German traffic sign data set that it almost has almost 100% accuracy on identifying road signs. And of course, a, a human is not that good. And uh, also, uh, Google has the uh, house number recognition uh, effort, where there is very, very good uh, uh, recognition of the, by the image of the house to know what's the house number. So as I told you, in 2012, uh, they started the ImageNet competition. And um, there are slightly more than 1 uh, million images, and there are 1,000 categories. And this is the snapshot of the result uh, that was back then. So the, out of the three winning teams, two of the teams were using uh, traditional image uh, uh, features. And the winning team uh, used for the first time in this uh, uh, competition uh, used the deep learning method. So that's the supervision team. And in terms of the error, they got really, really improved uh, accuracy uh, for the results, about 35 or 40 percent better accuracy, which is really good. And this is one of the main uh, factors that motivated the people shifting towards uh, deep learning based methods. And uh, on the following years in this competition, almost no one used anything else, but everyone started to actually use uh, deep learning with all kinds of variants to compete. The drawback of this willing solution is, as you can see, there, this is the actual neural network which was used. And it has eight layers, but basically uh, it's quite complex. There are a lot of different dimensions and a lot of parameters to tune uh, for this method. So that's kind of a headache. And they had to design all the specific layers and also how to fine tune the parameters and to use GPUs in order to actually be able to handle one million images. 
So now I want to show you uh, the same network that we have uh, re-implemented on top of uh, EC2, the same algorithm of the, this winning solution. And uh, we have quite good performance. So it takes 48 hours to train it on an Amazon G uh, G2 extra large instance uh, that has a single GPU. But once you throw in more GPUs, you get really improved performance. On a G2 8 extra large instance uh, with four GPUs, it's already uh, four times faster. And then it takes around 12 hours. So this is kind of state of the art of how much uh, this computation, if you want to get to really good accuracy, this is the kind of uh, effort you need to, to put. Uh, other type of applications that uh, are used for the computer vision uh, in deep learning, so for example, are uh, scene parsing. So given an image, you want to say what are the labeled uh, areas of the image, like uh, water, um, grass, sky, and so on house three. So this is something we also know how to do. And another application which is uh, very interesting is uh, a different type of application where you can actually, uh, given an image, you would like to find similar images based on their content. So in the next few minutes, I will actually tell you how we implement uh, this kind of application. And this is a different task because it's unsupervised tasks, so basically you have a large corpus of images, but you don't know what's inside the image, and you just want to find similar images. So let me uh, jump quickly to the second demo I wanted to show you, uh, which is this one. So this is a demo we did for, uh, oh, no, not this one, sorry. This one. So this is a demo we did for a retailer, uh, which sells fashion. So as you can see, there are uh, categories in the shop for which types of uh, fashion you like to buy. So let's say I want to buy a dress. But I like this dress, but it's not exactly what I'm looking for. So what I can do, I can click on a dress. The dress is sent to the predictive server. And then I get, using the uh, machine learning methods, uh, s more similar dresses based on the different patterns of the dress. So you can see um, all kinds of black and white patterns and so on that are kind of more similar. OK, so this is one of the other cool applications you can do uh, with deep learning, which actually uh, identify what are similar images. In terms of, uh, let's say you want to use deep learning, it's actually now, it's not that difficult. So we have our own implementation, which is, by the way, based on 6.6.net, which is an open source project, uh, where there are really, really simple interfaces for this kind of model. And I hope you can see the font uh, back. But Basically, what we have here, we have always uh, two commands that we can execute for building the model. The first command is a graphlab.neuralnet create, where we give a corpus of images with their labels. And this is a, actually an abstraction uh, for a very fine-tuned neural network, which implements convolutional neural network, which is uh, uh, very uh, tuned towards the task of multi-class uh, classification that I've shown you before. Uh, once you build this model, and this operation could be heavy, it could take a few hours based on how many images you got, then you would like to predict, given an image, what's inside it. And this operation, again, it's very easy. It's a single line of Python code where you can do model predict and uh, give the image. So this is run in real time. In about 10, 20 milliseconds, you can actually predict what's inside the image. So let me show you a bit of uh, code, how we generate this application. Uh, and this is a quick video I want to show. because I didn't want to risk uh, running a 
EC2 G2 instance from here. But uh, what we have here, uh, we have a recorded demo that I took earlier, which has an Amazon uh, EC2 machine with a GPU instance. So what we see here, we have an IPython notebook, which is a quick way of demoing uh, code. And the first thing I'm doing, I'm importing GraphLab. We are a fully supported Python package. And the second thing I'm doing is loading a repository of images, which are handwritten digits and their label. So I'm just pointing to a folder where all the images are found. Once I uh, load this uh, um, data set, I can show you how the images look like. So basically, they are handwritten digits. And the task is, of course, to find what's inside. So there are 60,000 images here. I'm taking just one tenth, so it will be a very quick demo. And we can run, build a neural network on top of the CPU of the machine. So in terms of performance, we run here two iterations, and each iteration uh, can handle about 1,600 images per second. What's more interesting is if you have a CUDA GPU, we can actually point to the GPU. You don't have to install anything. You don't have to configure anything. We just run on the uh, GPU. In this case, I'm running the full data set, 60,000 images, and uh, we have way better performance. We have uh, 30,000 images are processed per second. So it's much uh, better. It's uh, around 15 times faster. Another example for the classification task. So here I'm loading a test data set of 1,000 images, which are taken from ImageNet. I can show you the images. Some of them are more complicated. They have many objects inside. And now I'm loading a pre-trained deep learning network for the image net, the one that we trained for 48 hours. And the next thing I can do is actually predict for these 1,000 images what are their classes. And here it will take around 30 seconds. So it's about 30 milliseconds per image. And then we can find out the uh, class. So here is the way we can actually visualize it. Given an image, we can get the prediction and the true label. OK, so, so this is actually uh, the backbone of the demo I've shown you earlier. And as you can see, it's only a few lines of Python. Once you train the model, it's only a few lines of Python actually serving the model with our predictive server. So it's rather easy to build this kind of uh, application. OK, so if, um, if the deep learning is so great, why we don't use deep learning for everything and forget about all the other uh, algorithms and so on? So it is true that deep learning is a very good tool. Uh, it gets us very good accuracy. Uh, we can solve problems uh, that previously were harder to solve. And of course, there is potential of additional application that will come up next. Uh, but the problem with deep learning is that once you got a lot of images, you have to spend time training uh, the images. It takes many hours. But the problem is once you start to test on test images, you may get, uh, find out that your accuracy is not that good. And then you need to refine the network, add additional layers, change parameters, and so on. And the difficulty here is that only a handful of people in the world can actually understand what they are doing and what's happening inside the, the neural network and how to fine-tune it. So that's a major uh, roadblock for uh, deep learning. So the difficulties in deep learning is that first you have to have a lot of data, then it's very time-consuming, it's a, a the computation can be very heavy, and especially it's very hard to tune the methods once uh, you use them. It's almost impossible. So let's say regular people don't know, even, even I don't know how to carefully tune all the different layers and parameters. So what we can actually do, so are we uh, doomed, or is there some way uh, which we can uh, overcome this difficulty? 
And uh, actually, we propose uh, to do something else. Uh, our solution is uh, based on deep features. So what are these deep features? Deep features is actually a combination of deep learning plus transfer learning. So let me teach you how it works and why it's useful. So as you remember, in the standard image classification approach, we had an image, we had some extracted features, and then we used a simple classifier to understand what's inside the image. But what we can actually do, can we try to extract features out of the, deep, uh, of the neural network, the uh, deep learning network, in order to uh, get a better understanding of what's inside those images? And the fact is that we can actually do that. One, in the interesting, uh, one of the interesting examples is um, a data set which comes from a Kaggle competition which is called Cats versus Dogs. So the competition was given a lot of images of cats and dogs, you had to classify whether it's a cat or a dog. And this task you can learn using a neural network and you get very good accuracy. But the problems show up when you have a different data set. In this case, it's a data set which is called Caltech 101 data set that has 101 classes of different objects like cameras and chairs. Can, do you think that you can use cats and dogs in order to improve the classification of other objects like crocodiles and basketball and chairs? So it, sound, it sounds a bit non-intuitive. But the fact is that actually we can do it very well. So what we can do, we can learn a neural network on cats and dogs and actually extract some features in order to understand better other types of problems, which includes crocodiles and cameras and so on. And then we get really good accuracy for cats and dogs. So the question is, how, how can we do it? How does it work? So as I told you, in a neural net, there are all kinds of layers. And the high layers are the layers which has patches of images like human head and car wheel and so on, which are very specific to the learned classes. So what we can do, we can actually use the layers that are very general, like very small patterns of shapes and dots and things that can appear everywhere. And we would like to cut down all the specific uh, classes that are not useful for our task. And this is what we do. We take only partial uh, output out of the deep uh, network. And then, by extracting those uh, elements, we can actually use a simple classifier in order to understand uh, and to make classification. So this is the uh, deep features with transfer learning. And the way it works, you take some label data, you extract the features using a different trained data set. So in our example, we use Caltech 101 for the uh, task at hand, but we use information from uh, cats and dogs or from ImageNet. Uh, when we extract features, we actually get a vector. So for each image, let's say it was one megabyte uh, of an image, we get a short vector, which is maybe 200 numbers, 200 bytes. And then based on this vector, we would like to uh, learn a classifier. And tuning a simple classifier is way easier than tuning a neural network. And the other benefit here is that you don't have to waste the 12 hours or 48 hours in order to learn the neural network because we can actually give you the pre-trained neural network and probably in the future more and more people will release pre-trained neural network that you can actually use. So how does this work uh, in practice? So one of the interesting projects we did with, for a company for green energy, which is called Compology in the US, is uh, pictures of trash bins. Uh, they have sensors inside trash bins, and the task here is to find out whether the trash is full or empty. And this is, of course, a task we never experimented with. We didn't look into trash bins. We didn't have any images of trash bins. But by extracting features from ImageNet, we can actually learn very accurately uh, how much trash, and once there is a lot of trash, then they uh, send the truck in order to pick up the trash. And they are able to reduce about 30-40% of the truck uh, company cost in order to, uh, to solve this problem. And previously, before they used us, they actually 
had humans, like Mechanical Turk, they had some people in India classifying uh, trash images, and I looked at the data set, and the uh, classification was horrible. So you, you can't understand how people make it. It's completely bad uh, classification. So I want to show you very quickly another nice example uh, of things we can do. And this is uh, another project which, uh, what's nice about it, that we didn't do it, it's a contribution of our users in Barcelona. And what they did, they took uh, buildings in Barcelona, some 100 images, they extracted their features in order to get short vectors, and then they used the nearest neighbor model in order to form a graph of related uh, images, of related buildings. And it's a bit hard to see, but the buildings here are just numbers between 1 to 100, and if the numbers are rather close, the buildings are rather close. So what you can do with this kind of network is actually ask questions like, what is the architectural transition between a Gaudi building and some kind of a high-tech tower? And the network actually uh, enables, uh, is able to find an explanation which tells you this is the kind of um, steps you need to do uh, in terms of the shapes, in terms of the colors, in terms of the architectural styles uh, to explain uh, this kind of transition. And of course, the transition is a bit crude because they had only 100 images, but you can imagine if you have one million images of building, you can find really good uh, transitions for finding. So up to now, I told you a little about deep learning, but of course, I'm uh, from Dato, so I should tell you a little more about what we work on besides deep learning. And uh, at the heart of what we do, uh, we have a product which is called GraphLab Create, which uh, has a few properties. Uh, one of them is the fact that you can uh, have the implementation of very fine uh, machine learning uh, toolkits, as we call it, where deep learning is one of them. Uh, we give some tools for automatic ML um, um, configuration, like in the deep learning case, we configure the network for you and we allow you to uh, easily extract uh, reusable features. So besides of deep learning, uh, we have a lot of toolkits. So for example, Recommender Toolkit is a way of recommending products, uh, but we have many other uh, toolkits like Sentiment Analysis and Churn Prediction and uh, Graph Analytics and uh, other stuff. So we have tens of uh, toolkits. And in the heart of the implementation, I want to tell you a little bit about the implementation, uh, which is, by the way, based on an open source project, which is called S-Frame, uh, which is BSD license. We have a data structures that are really fine-tuned uh, for this kind of machine learning tasks. So we have two basic data structures. Uh, S-Frame is scalable data frame, and we have S-Graph, a scalable graph, on top of the S-Frame. And the basic idea behind S-Frame is that machines are really limited in the memory size. So when you have a machine, let's say, with 100 gigabyte memory, it's considered quite a big machine. But sometimes our data sets are way larger. So for example, think about the ImageNet data set. You have one million images. Each image is one megabyte. Very quickly, you get to really big data sets. So our thinking is, why don't we utilize um, flash drives and disk drives which have way more capacity, but they are kind of slower in performance. So how much do we lose? And we find out that actually uh, there is a great opportunity here. And the reason that those disks are very slow when you uh, do random access. But if you don't do random access, if you first design your algorithms to always, always do serial pass on the disk, then you can have way better performance because we all know, always know what will be the next part of the information that we loaded from this, and you can actually do it very well with a few parallel threads and keep a good pipeline of things coming in. And to those of you who maybe heard about it, we had an open source project called GraphChi a few years ago, which was a general proof of concept of this uh, uh, um, idea. But now we also implement it in GraphLab uh, Create. So let me show you a couple of slides about performance. How does it work? So this is a nice result from the Spark team. Um, and they worked on GraphX project, which is a graph analytics on top Spark. It has way better performance than Spark. And uh, it runs some kind of graph analytic task, which is a com connected comp components on Twitter graph. You have 
40 million nodes, 1.5 billion edges, uh, and the task is to find communities, to find connected components. So not only we are three and a half times faster, but you need to have 16 machines on uh, GraphX in order to be able to load this problem into memory, and uh, we can do it on a single machine using the out-of-core properties. So we are way faster. Uh, just a second. Yeah, so I'm, I want to show you something more. Um, another example is uh, our deep learning, of course. And you have the system H2O, which you may have heard about. Uh, they have uh, implemented um, image classification, the same digits data set that I've shown you a few seconds ago uh, to identify handwritten digits. So you have only 60,000 images. But with H2O, you need 10 machines for around 10 hours run, while uh, we actually can implement it on a single machine using four GPUs in four minutes, and also have way better accuracy. So it's, the implementation is way, way faster than other things. Uh, another example in terms of accuracy, so you have Spark Emily, which is a not only that we run around 50 times faster, we also were uh, significantly more accurate uh, in terms of the classification accuracy. And uh, here, one is the optimal accuracy, so the higher is the better. So those are some uh, performance results. So just to recap uh, quickly uh, what we have, we have a very efficient data structure. It's an open source project, BSD license which is really optimized for out-of-core and high performance for the machine learning methods. And the interfaces are in Python, but we actually also now released a, a, another sub-project, which is called S-Frame Spark, when it has also a Scala bindings and Python bindings, so you can actually connect to Spark and translate the RDDs uh, into our data structure and then do some fancy analytics that they don't have in Spark and save them, if you like, back to Spark. Uh, let me tell you a little more about uh, the components of uh, our system. So I mentioned in a bit more detail the S-Frame and S-Graph, which are part of the open source engine. On top of it, we have some visualization tools that are called Canvas. And on top of them, we have the machine learning um, toolkits, which are um, all the different implementations of the libraries uh, that you can get for a license. So that's a, a, a license is required. We have a, a $4,000 cost for a license, but uh, it's also academic uh, free. So anyone here from the university can just get a free license. Uh, on top of the machine learning uh, model building capabilities, we have uh, what we call predictive services, which are server uh, that serve uh, those models in production. And the idea is that if you want uh, to quickly ship a model into production, it's very easy. And besides of the predictive services, we have also a distributed implementation we call data distributed. It runs on top of a Hadoop cluster, and it speeds up uh, some more the, um, the distributed processing. So many of the algorithms have their own uh, distributed equivalent, and it depends if you need um, what's the requirement, whether it's speed or uh, accuracy and so on, uh, but in many cases we can solve really large problems on even on a single uh, multi-core machine. One marketing slide. So we do have a lot of uh, customers uh, coming up, which are uh, paying customers. We have very good uh, visibility uh, in the market, so we have three types of use cases, uh, especially in the areas of recommender system, graph analytics, and uh, homeland security type fraud uh, applications. One of the interesting uh, things we recently released is uh, a course which is named the Machine Learning Foundation. That's a Coursera course. It is composed of five parts. The 
All five are different aspects of applied machine learning, so it's actually a combination of five courses and a practical project. You can take this course for free, or you can get a certification from the uh, University of Washington and Coursera, um, if you like to, to pay Coursera. And all the exercises in this course are based on uh, GraphLab Create. So that's a great way to learn applied machine learning. Each course is about seven to eight weeks, and all the videos are online. So if you're interested in recommender systems, in deep learning, in classification, in regression, and so on, uh, you can learn the different primitives. And of course, uh, if you register to the course, you also get a free license uh, for GraphLab Create. So it's, uh, you can also do the exercise. OK, so this is what I want to show you. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Any questions for Danny? Uh, we have a mic coming up. <laughs> oh, yeah, so we have a lot of different uh, functionality. Uh, I chose to focus on one of them because we have we really span different fields. But we have a lot of activity around recommender systems. So we have customers like Johnson & Johnson, PetSmart, Barnes & Noble, Pandora, Adobe, and, uh, and even Spotify who use us uh, for different aspects of the computing the recommendations. So that's one area where we have a lot of activity. We have a lot of activity around graph analytics. So it could be transaction graph, credit cards, emails, Bitcoin transactions, things like that, where you want to find communities to detect uh, access to resources, things like that. So that's another area where we have a lot of activity. And we have also uh, much activity around uh, text analytics. Um, and, and all of those things, I, I couldn't show everything, so I wanted to focus on one thing. But anyone who wants to come uh, for the training today, I will show a completely different set of functionality on the training today. And also, we have a meetup uh, jointly with Spotify uh, this evening. So. Most likely, you don't want to hear too many lectures, but if you have friends around, uh, you want to invite them, so we would love to host them. Any other questions? Over here. How does your algorithm distinguish between similarities in dresses and similarities in the girls wearing the dresses? Yeah, so uh, we don't make this distinction. Um, what we have is basically, we have an implementation of what I talked about in detail. So basically, we first learn a model using the ImageNet. We, for the dresses, we extract feature vectors of the dresses. And once uh, we have a world of feature vectors, given a, a vector, it's very easy to find some nearby vectors. So we don't really understand what's inside the dress. We don't know if it's a woman or a dress or a dog or something. Give us an image. Uh, an image will give you kind of a similar one. Without knowing the content. Yeah, so, so it depends on the, also on the, what's the relative size of the dress inside the image and things like that. But if you have, let's say, two naked models that, that are the same and so on, it may, they may show up as a, as a similar image as well, yeah. So there was another question up there. Uh, so after you extract the features, uh, what kind of data structures do you use to store them to do a fast, let's say, nearest neighbor search? Yeah, so there is a two-step uh, procedure. So first you extract features, you get vectors of a similar size. So let's say they are size 200, you can find you in the size. Once you have those vectors, we have what we call nearest neighbors models, which are implemented in one of few ways. So we have KD trees and all kinds of hierarchical trees and things like that you can build out of the vectors. And you can either save, save them in raw format or you can save the model itself if you like. You can export the model. Uh,
Sorry? <laughs> okay, so for 200 dimensions, does KD tree work well? Because I don't think that KD tree is scalable beyond maybe 10 dimensions or so. No, no, it works really well. And all the demo I showed you are actually running on, on real time. Okay. So once I choose a dress, the image is sent to the server, the features are extracted in real time, and then there is a KD3 query, which runs on real time, okay. and the typical performance is between 5 to 10 milliseconds. I see. Okay. And do you also do some kind of uh, uh, dimension reduction techniques like principal component analysis? Or, uh, uh, not yet, but we have, not specifically PCI or SVD, but we have a lot of uh, matrix factorization-based methods, okay. uh, which can be also another way of doing dimensional theory reduction. Okay. But th you. that's something on our roadmap. Right. So over here. Just a curiosity. You said that uh, you have different applications, and I guess that this type of data learning is also used for text, right? So I'm just wondering if you, how much could takes uh, the changing of the parameters and the filtering in order to uh, adapt this, so the, the algorithm for a specific type of uh, yes. search. So in very uh, detailed expression, suppose that you have a terabyte of uh, report, error report. Uh, how much it takes uh, to adapt uh, the algorithm in a way that from now on, you can learn from a previous error and immediately identify the type of error that could come from a new error information, error report. Yeah, so it's a, it's a bit of an involved question. So first of all, our data frame, uh, scalable data frames, S frame as we call them, are generic in the type they can store inside images, text, sparse vectors, and dense vectors and dictionaries and everything. So everything is stored in the same data structure. So for us, it doesn't really matter if you work with images, you work with text, you work with graphs, you work with tabular data, dense data. It doesn't really matter. It's the same. Everything is on the same implementation. So if you want to classify images, you, you put images into the data frame. If you want to classify text, you put text into the data frame. So we work, all the algorithms work on all the input types. In terms of the learning, it is true that you want to be uh, more adaptive. In, uh, when you have new information, you want to fine-tune the model and take care into that. We are working in this direction. Uh, I didn't talk much about our predictive server, but what we add there, uh, we add the support for multi-armed bandits uh, methods, which actually means that you try out, um, you experiment at the shop, you choose some clothes, and then uh, we learn your preferences and dynamically update the model. And uh, we can select between a few different models to blend them together and find the right uh, adaptation between the model and uh, what's the um, users that, that use them. So that's a, but, but that's a very difficult question. And of course, you cannot do it for any model. Some of the models are very difficult to update in real time. And some of them are way easier. So all our processing is uh, what we call offline bulk. Computation is very intensive. It, it takes minutes or hours. It doesn't take real-time information into account. Uh, but we have some workaround methods in order to influence data in real time. But, but not for all the models. It depends on the model. All right. Yes, one final question, perhaps? Uh, Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was curious if there is any use of pre-processing techniques before actually putting those images into the deep neural network, or is that something use, uh, useless and doesn't Yeah, really so that's a, that's a great question. So the magic of neural networks is you don't do anything, and in fact, we even don't know the format. So we can take JPEG, we can take PNG, we don't know the encoding, we don't know the layers, we don't know the frequencies and so on. We just put it as a binary vector with the, all the images have to be the same length. That's the pre-processing. So if you have one image which is different size, so you, you may need to crop all the images to the same length to have them the exact same size. But besides of that, we don't know the um, 
outlying uh, uh, the underlying um, formats. So it's kind of a magic because you can have BMP, JPEG, PNG, they have completely different encoding. And still, we learn the feature of a cat inside a JPEG. There are maybe some areas where that are different in the features of the cat inside the BMP file. All right. Okay. So let's thank, thank Dan again for an excellent presentation. Thanks thank you. Lot.